Okay. So, uh, a couple of reminders uh, coming up on the weekend here, of course, Monday at Point, uh, due this weekend as usual. Um, there's no uh, unit assessment or no formal unit assessment, assessment assigned for this unit E. Instead, those questions are pulled up into the midterm review unit assessment. So, um, if you that's the one again that if you can, you can take as many times as you like, your highest score will be taken. Um, it's a little bit longer than a normal unit assessment because it basically grabs, I think, about three questions from each of the five units randomly. So every time you take it, you might get a different assessment. And that gives you a chance to practice um, a set of questions from each of those units that are very similar to the questions that I'll put on this term. Um, then on Tuesday, we'll have that midterm review uh, lecture period. So bring your questions. Happy to field those. And uh, alternatively, if there are no questions, and I can just sort of hit, I think are kind of the greatest hits from every unit until questions pop up. Uh, then stage one of the midterm is on uh, Thursday, a week from today. Uh, that uh, will uh, be, uh, you can come here, but bring a laptop because it'll be a Canvas basis exam, or you can take it uh, at home. Uh, it will be available definitely all day Thursday. And then uh, I'm deciding whether it'll be all day Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or all day Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but I'm going to give you at least three days that you have flexibility to start it. And then once you start it, you'll have 90 minutes to finish it. If you come to class, you only have the class period, which means 75 minutes. It's designed for a lot shorter than that, but I just find 90 minutes so that you get uh, the full 75 plus 15 minutes for any technical challenges you, you might have, because that's a lockdown browser, um, a respondent's lockdown browser really. So they have to take that with the lockdown. And then um, sort of two weeks from, um, right, so that's a week from today. So basically a week and a half. So the Tuesday that follows that, uh, so a week from this upcoming Tuesday will be stage two. And that will be the exact same exam. You will not get answers between the two stages. You won't get your scores between the two stages. Uh, the most I'll give you is uh, I might put together like a little histogram of uh, you know, how everyone did as a group, and I might put it in to say, well, these have tend to be the hardest questions, uh, but individually, you won't know how well you did. Um, so then on stage two, that will be open book, open notes, open canvas, any resources I've provided you, you'll be able to use. Uh, you'll get um, all of that Tuesday, and again, I'm probably going to make that extend like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's not a time test. You can collaborate with anyone else enrolled in the course. You can come here Tuesday during the lecture period and work together, or you can work, you know, apart. You can work on Discord. You can work on Slack, um, or you can don't have to collaborate at all. It's not a group assignment. You just can't use each other um, to help improve your score from stage one to stage two. After all, the availability window for stage two closes, then I'll release the scores and the answers. And your uh, total midterm score will be 80% stage one plus 20% uh, stage two. Uh, only other thing is, um, I think due sometime uh, mid March is the creative project proposal, which is just a short one page, maybe two uh, proposal, of what you're planning on doing for the creative project. I have added uh, details about what's expected there, including a rubric. So if you're thinking ahead, and what you want to do for your creative project, you might uh, take a look at that creative project proposal assignment on Canvas because I've added some details there. So, any questions about any of that? <clears throat> All right, so um, I wanted to make sure that we covered some specific things and then extend. Um, from from last time, so make sure we hit all the high points um, that uh, that you know might have been subtle in the chapter. Highlight important things that I think I want you to take on from sort of thinking about uh, this kind of thermodynamic approach to thinking about systems, um, and then see what else we can do with that approach. Um, so um, you know, so we'll talk about these things called dissipative structures. Um, we'll apply these approaches to economics to sort of think about how 
Uh, these approaches can tell us about wealth distributions in communities and will think uh, about information and how uh, it, uh, it, how we find it in the real world, how these frameworks help us think differently about the real world in terms of information. So um, if you remember from last time, uh, you know, it talked about how statistical mechanics um, takes, uh, so StatMec, uh, shorthand, uh, takes a stochastic modeling approach. And this is in contrast, um, you know, instead of deterministic. And this word stochastic, I said, comes from the Greek for guess or conjecture. And so the idea here is that we assume random behavior to make life easier. So does anybody remember what I meant by that last time? So why would assuming random behavior make it easier for us to think about systems? Yeah. You can eliminate variables by using probabilities as long as, you know, like if something's going to happen 30% of the time, you don't need to think about the small variables. You just need to have it happen 30% of the time. No. So that's great the way you said that. Eliminate small variables. and replace with statistics. So if I'm to model students coming in uh, to uh, you know, a classroom, um, I might be interested in the, how much time in between every student. You know, so one student comes in, you wait another 30 seconds, another student comes in, you wait another 10 seconds, another student comes in. A deterministic model would, based on, you would have to predict then 10, then 5, then 4. You say, well, how am I going to predict those intervals of time between students? Well, in theory, if we zoom out and look at the entire university, maybe the entire city, we can say, all right, um, so person A is at this location that's this far away. Um, they're going to take this long to walk from this building to this building. They're going to you know, have to interact with these people. They might get stopped on the way. Uh, you know, there's all of these different details they have to put in there that really aren't that knowable. I mean, in principle, I guess, you know, if you had sort of a bird's eye view, you might be able to predict, but you would almost need the data instantaneously because you, you're just not going to know ahead of time. So all of the deterministic details are really almost unknowable. And so we replace, the, we consider them to be a source of uncertainty. Then we say, you know what, really, um, uncertainty can be modeled by randomness. So rather than trying to figure out exactly what the sequence of inter-arrival time is going to be, let's just say, you know what, on average, we get three students arriving every minute. And, um, and, and they're not going to be arriving like 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds in between. If we can come up with a random distribution that produces roughly three students every minute that has variability, then that would probably be good enough. And there is a distribution out there called the exponential distribution that, um, that does exactly that. That's actually very well suited for individual arrivals. So when people arrive to a door independently, if you know on average how many arrive in an interval, you can create what's known as this exponential distribution. So it's just an example here. And I only bring this up because we'll see this uh, in a second or a little bit here. So an exponential distribution of inter-arrival times. I'll say of independent inter-arrival times. And basically, if you look at the frequency distribution, you can have the inter-arrival time so the time in between arrivals here, and you can look at the frequency here. 
And an exponential distribution looks uh, a little bit like this. And it has an average, average uh, interarrival time. So for example, it might be like 20 seconds. So this would be the exponential distribution for um, an average of three arrivals per minute. So on average, on average, um, people are arriving three arrivals per minute, but it's not 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. It means that there's, um, there's gonna be quite a few people that arrive less than 20 seconds. And there will be um, a decent amount of people arrive more than 20 seconds, but very few will be way higher than 20 seconds. And so you do get some people that distract, you know, like sometimes you get like three minutes in between their arrivals. Most of the time you get 10 or 20 seconds of three minutes between arrivals. With those outliers out here, three minutes or so, drag the average out. And so you end up getting this shape here and that's an exponential. So if I could ask a computer to draw random variables from an exponential that has this average 20 seconds, it's going to give me inter-arrival times through that door that look realistic. But I can, I, but so one parameter, the average here, how many arrivals per minute, uh, or how many, the same thing would be the average time in between. With that one parameter, I get a whole bunch of variability that's, uh, you know, automatic. I don't need to know all the other details are going on in the universe. That's what we mean by a stochastic approach. We are just assuming that people arrive randomly, even though every one of you I could ask, well, why did you arrive exactly what you did? You could tell me, you know, a deterministic story of how you got to that door. You didn't just magically arrive there like some quantum mechanical particle was popping into existence. There was a true deterministic story there, but we can wipe that out um, and just replace it with this as if you were some quantum mechanical particle just popping into existence. So that's what we mean by stochastic model. That makes sense. So casting is often for randomness, but there's nuance there. So cast the, the reason why stochastic isn't just a synonym. Stochastic is an approach where you use randomness to simplify models that may not actually be random. So it's you know saying that there's stochasticity in the world is someone saying there's uh, the world is so complicated that. I, it's easier for me to just assume it's random. That's what people mean when they say there's stochastic effects. That means I'm not willing to expand, expand the boundary of my model farther than a particular amount. I'm going to stop short and replace the rest with randomness because that's easier. All right. Any questions about that? Very common approach in systems thinking use stochasticity instead of deterministic models at some point. All right. So uh, with that, um, if we think about things like, uh, you know, mechanics, that's the motion of particles. You know, so, um, so in StatMec, you know, the mechanic part of it, is saying, you know, that's the motion of particles in, or of, it's motion of things in space, in physical space. So that's the mech part of it. But then the stat part of it is we don't use Newton's laws, we use probability distribution. So we use randomness. And that just makes it a lot easier because we don't have to think about what causes a molecule to move around. There is a deterministic story for every molecule in, of air in this room, but it would be crazy to build a model of every molecule in this room and how they interact with each other. So instead, we just say it's a gas, and, um, and we say every molecule moves randomly, and then we look at the stats of all the molecules together. That's what statistical mechanics is. And then, so then you can start asking, all right, so it was all random, then what configurations of these molecules are most likely? And so um, that 
suggests another modeling tool we use in systems thinking um, is multi scale modeling. <laughs> Where we have at least two scales, sometimes more, but we'll just start out saying we've got two a micro scale. And these are the actual configurations of the fine scale uh, system. So these are like positions, velocities. Etc. And then we've got a macro scale. And these are functions or properties. So uh, we refer to these as functions of state, equations of state, properties or types of state. So these are um, types or functions. Or equations of, um, and I'll put some usually we just say state, but I'll say of micro state that group micro states together. And so this allows us to create. Um, and this allows us to so called coarse grain the system. So it's an additional simplification step. We've already added randomness to make our lives easier, uh, but we still have to deal with the gazillion of particles in this room. Well, if we had a way to replace all of the particles in this room with somehow chunkier elements where there's fewer of them for us to keep track of, then our models are going to be simpler. And that's what we refer to as a coarse grain. Can I come up with a coarser grain representation of the air in this room? That's what the school mechanics did. Likewise, when you talk about the economics or you know, the economy, then you can say, um, can I, I don't want to keep track of every single one of the 300 to 400 million people in the United States, can I come up with a simpler set, a coarser grain set of variables that somehow captures what's going on in the US economy without having to keep track of every single player in the US economy? That is a coarse graining as well. So it's our approach of, of simplifying our models. And so, um, you know, examples of this, you know, there could be uh, temperatures. You could say, um, like, if it is 70 degrees in here, what are all of the, um, the different ways that the molecules in this room um, could be configured if it was 70 degrees? So 70 degrees means their average kinetic velocity is proportional to 70 degrees. So if we know that, then you can say, well, what are, what's the probability of, um, of each one of these? Like, if, if, what set of microstates is consistent with 70 degrees, you know, so likewise, I could say density. Um, you know, that's, you know, other ones. Um, I could say uh, pressure, concentration, um, you know, is another one. Or one that I'm going to show you in a second, distribution. And so as we will see, um, I can say, I can treat a distribution of particles as a macro state. I can say particles are uniformly distributed across this space. Okay, how many microstates have particles uniformly distributed? Well, you know, I could say, well, there's there's some particles here, there's some particles here, some particles over there. That's uniformly distributed. They're everywhere. I could take a particle here and move it over there, and take another particle here and move it back over here. I have a new microstate. I've moved particles around, but it's still uniformly distributed. So the uniform distribution of particles is itself a macro state. I could consider how many different ways could I put all the particles in that corner of the room? And I could say how many uh, different microstates would have all the particles compressed in that corner of the room? 
and so on and so forth. And so even, you know, so a macrostate can be a funny thing. It's just some way to group microstates. That's really what a macros, uh, what a macrostate is, a coarse grain. And for all of those, um, we can say for every macrostate, we have multiplicity, which is the number of microstates in a macrostate. So there could be a gazillion ways you can rearrange particles in this room, but half of them might be in one macrostate you've identified, and another half of them might be in another macrostate you've identified. Um, and so those two multiplicities would be equal. They'd both be half of whatever that giant number is. Now, um, with that, we can start asking um, if we know that all the microstates are equally likely, then we can start saying, how likely are all the macrostates? Well, the macrostate has a higher multiplicity. It's more likely because it's adding up more of the equally likely microstates. And so, um, and that helps us build new models. So I can sort of draw a picture here uh, where I could say that you know, these, here is one macrostate. And let's say there are 100 microstates in some system. And I've got one macrostate has 95 of them. And another macrostate has the other five. So I could be in any microstate equally likely, but it's going to be more likely that I'm in the macrostate that has 95 of them in there. Now, at any instant of time, these things are, are moving around randomly. They're moving from one microstate to another. And so I could say, well, if I'm in, if this is macrostate A and this is macrostate B, then I can start calculating, well, how likely is it for me to move from A to B? Well, if I'm in A, there's five microstates out of 100 that will bring me to B. But if I'm in B, there's 95 microstates out of 100 that will bring me back to A. If I'm in um, B, there's only five microstates out of 100 that will bring me back to B. If I'm in A, there's 95 microstates out of 100 that will bring me back to A. And so we can start imagining that if you start in some random spot, you know, say you start at B, and then you imagine at some infinitesimal tick of the clock, you sort of flip a coin representing like, there's been movement in the system, and you ask, uh, have I stayed in B or have I gone to A, then it's very unlikely that I'll stay in B. I probably moved over to A. And once I'm in A, it's very unlikely I go back to B. I probably stay in A. Now, I will sometimes uh, get lucky and go to B, but then very quickly I'll come back into A. So I spend a lot more time in A than B. Doesn't mean I don't ever go back to B. It's just I tend to reside most of the time in macrostate A. And so, um, does that make sense? Any questions about this interpretation? We've chunked up some number of microstates, some complicated description of a system, into coarser macrostates. And we asked how many of the underlying microstates are in each. And we use that to define a probability that says, how likely are you when you're in a macro state to stay in the macro state or go to another macro state? And with that, we can see that the macro states that have more microstates in them tend to be the ones where the system was going to hang around. 
It's just going to get to them much more quickly. And once they're in them, it's going to be stuck in them. So there's somehow more stability in this macro state than this micro state. Is that clear? And so if it's not clear, these numbers here, this is the multiplicity here. Multiplicity of A right there, and uh, that down there is the multiplicity of B. And so uh, like this could be the uniformly distributed air in this room. This could be clumped air in this room. There's only five ways to clump all the air in a corner in this room. There's 95 ways to spread it uniformly throughout. So we would expect most of the time it's going to be uniformly, even though occasionally it will clump out, but it doesn't happen very often. So most of the time it's going to happen. All right, and that's basically a statement of, um, of the second law of thermodynamics. That uh, more macro states, or I'd say systems tend, tend to reside in macro states with more higher multiplicity. And then unless acted upon by an outside, you know, outside uh, inner force, or unless you know, basically work is done. And so this is just what naturally happens. You know, that air spreads out. That naturally happens, but. I could put effort into grabbing up all the air in this room. I could get a vacuum cleaner. I could get a, an air pump or something. I could, you know, and I could suck all the air over and then I could, you know, put it out in a high pressure zone, creating a vacuum there, a high pressure zone over there. That would take energy to do. So if I'm willing to put energy in, I can get things to go against this. But if I don't put any energy in, if the system is closed, it doesn't have any energy coming into it, no inputs coming into it, then it's going to tend to go towards states that have more <laughs> possibility, more microstates. That's the second law. Any questions about that? Yeah. When the system is closed, is there always an equal chance of each microstate occurring if there's the same? Probability of each micro state. That's a great question. So the question was: If the system's closed, is it always the case that all microstates are equally probable? And um, we usually assume so, but there are systems in which uh, some microstates might be more probable than others. Um, you can get complications. For example, uh, like gravity. At large, large scales, gravity starts to become uh, an issue. So. Um, at small scales, we kind of expect that everything should spread out, you know, but at large scales, we kind of expect everything's going to clump up because of gravity. So um, the interpretation of the second law uh, gets a little fuzzier when you zoom out to scales, you have to worry about things like gravity. But, um, but for most of our conceptual thinking here, we can assume that microstates are equally likely. Now, when I get to Shannon entropy or, or information, then in that case, we create systems where microstates are more likely or less likely. So uh, if, I, um, uh, if I am a message source, I'm a macro state, there might be certain messages I'm just more likely to send to you than others. And in that case, we might need to weight them so that they're not equally likely and we have a way to deal with that. So that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. But uh, for the most part, uh, we consider microstates to be.
All right. Okay, so um, what we've sort of said here is that if we want to really write down something that we thought we could maybe use to, to get more quantitative understanding, so far, all I can say is that the shapes, the second law, could be written as the change in multiplicity tends to be greater than zero if in a closed system. And that maybe makes sense conceptually, but it's not that useful quantitatively. We actually want to think about systems. And so that's the reason why Boltzmann said, wouldn't it be nice if we had a quantity that we could decompose? Because for one thing, there are no true closed systems. The only closed system is the universe. So if we really want to talk about when uh, the change in multiplicity is guaranteed to go up, that's really only going to happen at the scale of the universe. At, our, um, at the individual planetary scale, um, it doesn't have to be the case. I mean, we are living beings. We live at lower entropy than the non-living things around us. And so we are an example of when, in an open system, the multiplicity can go down. We can become, you can go from a, a more frequent microstate to a less, or more frequent macrostate to a less frequent macrostate. Life is an oddity, and that's what we're going to have to talk about here, is where life comes from. Then. So we really need a way to decompose the universe into the Earth and everything else, into this classroom and everything else. So we need something more quantitative that allows us to, to make more sense of this. And so that's why, uh, you know, Boltzmann came up with Boltzmann entropy, which we call S. And he had that little formula of it. So it has this proportionality constant that does not have. This is just in order for Boltzmann to be used, you need to incorporate into other physical laws or outside the scope of this class. So if you go and take a physics class where they start talking about entropy, S shows up in equations. In order to use S, it has to have the right units. And so he said, okay, so S has got to be, the, the real thing that matters is going to follow here. And S is going to be proportional to that. And the proportionality constant, that's Boltzmann's constant, just makes the rest of the physics go. And that's why Shannon, when he defined, redefined entropy, just got rid of that. because We don't need it. It's arbitrary. And so, and likewise, another arbitrary thing was the choice of a logarithm. So um, Boltzmann chose to use the natural logarithm because that's what physicists like to use. It's the log base E. So log base E. Um, but, uh, or natural log. But it actually doesn't matter what logarithm you use, it will change the coefficient you put out front. But it just matters that it's a logarithm. That's all that matters. And then he said, we'll take the natural log of the multiplicity of a macro state. And if we do this, this is a different way to conceptualize multiplicity that allows us to decompose things. Because we know that, um, that we know that the natural log or the log in general of any number of macro, so of one multiplicity of system A times the multiplicity of system B, uh, this here is the multiplicity of system A combined with system B. That's one of the reasons why we call it multiplicity. If a macrostate has five microstates and you another macrostate for a different system has 20 macrostates, if you combine those systems together and say, if I'm in macrostate A over here and macrostate B over here, and this one has five microstates, this one has 20 microstates. 
how many microstates do I have if I combine the system together? Well, it can be in any one of these five and any one of these 20. So overall, your new microstate of the two system combined is five times 20. Five times 20 is 100, I think. So um, we, that's part of the reason we call the number of microstates multiplicity, is that as you add systems together, you multiply their multiplicities to get the multiplicity of the new system. And the natural log has this nice feature that when you multiply things together, you add their logarithm. So the log of a product is just the sum of the logs. And so that means that the entropy of a system of a combination of A plus B is just the entropy of A plus the entropy of B. That now allows us to decompose these things. We can now say entropy of the universe is entropy of Earth plus entropy of everything else. We can do multiple. We could say entropy of living systems plus entropy of non-living systems plus entropy of the solar system plus everything else. So we can start breaking these things up. And all we know is that the, the universe's entropy has got to go up. But there are a bunch of different ways to get the universe's entropy to go up. You can get local decreases in entropy on Earth just so long as that there's some other increase elsewhere that is going up. And that's, um, you know, basically, um, you know, saying that another way, I can say that change, that's what this delta means, change, but change and the entropy everywhere is just the change in the entropy here plus the change in the entropy, um, I'll say there, meaning everywhere else. And so we know that by the second law, the sum, I'll put parentheses around there, this is what the second law says. But that means that this can go down so long as this goes way up. That's the beauty of this. We now can explain how localized order emerges. Uh, it, it, order emerges when you create more disorder elsewhere. So this is why, one of the reasons why, and I, I mentioned this in some of the comments on the perusal readings and things, and the entropy has come up locally. A lot of people say, like, you know, living systems are um, enemies of, uh, of entropy, or entropy is the enemy of life or whatever. As I'm going to talk about here, life is actually an engine of entropy generation. Our existence, our ordered existence, means that there is mass destruction going on in the rest of the universe somewhere. All of the order that we pick up is means far, far more disorder somewhere else. Um, you know, and that's so it's not that you know, life isn't. Uh, I mean, in some ways, yeah, if life didn't have energy coming in, it would break down just like the air cluster in the corner would eventually spread out through the room. But life itself, you say, well, how the hell did we get life to begin with? Well, it turns out that life, as we'll see in a second, is a tool for entropy increase. Is that our role, our universal role, our colossal cosmological role is not to fight entropy, it's to build more and more entropy. We hasten the death of the universe by being, that's what this is gonna say. All right, so any questions about this? Okay. Okay, so um, I just want to point out, though, that, um, that if we assume that entropy has gone down, um, that that means that we've had to add energy to this thing here. So if I were to rewrite this last statement, S everywhere, the 
equals s here. I'll say, sorry, change in s everywhere is equals change in s here plus change in s there. And I know that that whole quantity goes up. That's the second law there. If this goes down, so a decrease here requires addition of work or energy. So I can't reduce, I can't make something more ordered unless I put effort into it. Well, where the heck does the effort come from? It comes from the other side. So this one here, um, that one is going to uh, have a larger increase in entropy and, um, and we're gonna get the work. So work comes from here. And that is what causes the increase in entropy above the decrease over there. So it's kind of like the pushing on the box example. I can put a lot of effort into pushing on a box. If I get the box moving, some of the energy I put into it is not going into making the box move. It's going to make me warmer, the box warmer. It's going to increase the entropy of the system. And so I put work into it. So work was transferred from me to the box, but then entropy was generated. Likewise, if you, have a, if you break a system down into one that's getting more order, the one that is getting uh, the other side of it is usually the fuel that's making this thing um, get more order. And as a, a consequence, that it's like putting push on the box. It creates more disorder. And um, and that so that means that there is some ability to do work. That there must be some ability to do work in this thing. And after it works on here, we reduce the ability to do work. So it's like there is um, this thing has the ability. do work, but that decreases as work organizes other subsystems. So my, what I'm trying to get at here is that the increase in energy or in entropy to the other, to this fuel here, is actually going to reduce its ability to decrease the entropy of this later. So we're gradually over time losing the net ability to do work. Energy itself is being conserved. That's the first law of thermodynamics. You can't ever get rid of energy. But regardless of where the, the but the energy sort of goes goes from a useful place to a not useful place. Entropy itself is not useful, um, whereas the ability to do work that is useful. And this ability to do work is what we're going to call free energy. So there's energy and then there's free energy. Um, and so, like, let me paint a picture. All right, so the picture here has got um, the Earth, so we've got the Earth here.
And uh, over on this side, maybe we've got the sun. The sun is bringing energy to the earth. It's heating up the earth. Um, and so the sun is doing work on the earth. Now, it turns out the sun is very low entropy. And that actually makes sense. When you look at the sun, it's got one color. It's a giant hot ball in the sky. A whole lot of matter has been compressed into one spot in the middle of the sky. It's burning bright. It is extremely predictable. You know what, the, you see the sun, you immediately recognize it. It is not variable at all. That is extremely low entropy. That is just a source of low entropy. And uh, so it's extremely low entropy. That's our sun system. You can think of sort of the sun there. And, um, and it is bringing um, its um, energy. It turns out this will be free energy. It has the ability to do work. So we'll, um, we'll see this is so. From the sun. So the sun retains its ability to do work because it has so little entropy. Now on Earth, what do we got? Well, on Earth, like on the ground of Earth, we have a bunch of non-life, rocks and other sorts of things. But then on Earth, we have humans, We've got, I don't know, ants. Uh, you know, we've got uh, all sorts of, you know, dogs and cats and other sorts of living things. Um, so we've got life. So we can say that, you know, if we think about the solar system as our closed system, then we've got a certain amount of entropy in life plus a certain amount of change in entropy in non-life plus a change in entropy of the sun. And we know that, I'm going to move this down a little bit. And we know that all of that together by the second law, it's got to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, so, in order for us to get life, life is extremely ordered. It's really recognizable. You can definitely tell. You look out, that thing's a lot. That thing's a lot. There's no uncertainty. Life looks weird. And that weirdness, that rarity, that means it's low entropy. So, we've had a decrease in entropy. And in the sun, the sun has probably, in doing work on us, it's probably had a small increase in its entropy. But for the most part, all of the non-living things on Earth have had a much larger increase. And that's what's driving the net increase in entropy from the second law. And so as we organize things into uh, living beings, um, those living beings end up processing the world around them in order to maintain their own structure. And they start eating themselves as well. So, you know, you eat up and, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, living organisms often eat other things like eat plants or whatever. Um, things look very unique going into an animal. Things look pretty much the same coming out. And so, you know, the fact that all poop looks the same demonstrates that um, the living being has actually increased entropy. You know, you've gone from knowing what something was going in to not knowing what it was. You increase the uncertainty you um, increase the randomness. And so the decrease that you get from life is maintained 
by a massive increase in entropy um, in the non-life here. And so overall, if we look at the total system, we get an increase um, in entropy. So at first, the combo has low entropy at first. But then what happens? Well, and then free energy inside the system um, decreases entropy locally, um, but minimizes or it's our increases entropy globally. Thereby reducing free energy. Eventually our sun will burn out. It will cease to be a bright spot in the sky and we'll just start looking like everything else. Of course, it'll become a red giant and all that sort of things. You know, it will somehow, but eventually everything will become just another rock in the sky. And, um, and that will mean the free energy in our solar system will have gone very, very close to zero. Our, our solar system will lose the ability to do work. At the moment, parts of our solar system can do work on other parts of our solar system. And that is what creates life. But at the larger scale, um, it's internally changing the structure of the solar system. So the solar system itself, over time, loses the ability to do work. And that is the second law. It's the sort of inevitable loss of free energy. And so when we have a lot of free energy, we get something called a dissipative structure that forms. So that's kind of this term that we talk about. And this is something that a Nobel laureate named Prigogine formalized. And so dissipative structures are uh, <coughs> highly structured transient um, why I'll call them objects, I'm saying transient, I'll say objects that rapidly increase entropy production and then burn out. And they form when we have high um, or free energy. Examples of this, tornadoes, hurricanes, life itself. Life has been described as a hurricane. Uh, there is so much free energy from the sun that it generates, it has the ability to temporarily structure something into an engine that produces entropy even faster than would be produced uh, at a normal rate if there wasn't such a, 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 um, a difference. Likewise, hurricanes don't exist all the time, but once you get a temperature difference, once you get a free energy uh, gap on the earth, in the atmosphere that's large enough, then the clouds start organizing themselves into these colossal structures that leave destruction in their wake. They rapidly destroy everything, increasing entropy, and then they run out of fuel and they dissipate. That's what they call dissipative structures, they're transient. But while they're around, they generate far more entropy than um, the decrease in entropy it took to produce them. And, um, and so 
With this idea in mind, free energy and this kind of structure, we can go back to our ball and basin model and we can plot out, like, imagine. Um, so, if we think about ball and basin. But now on the on the x-axis, um, I'll put macro state, and on the y-axis, I'll put free energy. And so we can imagine two setups: one where there's a small amount of free energy. And the other where there's a huge amount of free energy. So um, you can imagine that uh, in the small amount, you might get sort of a shallow uh, basin here, um, where if you were to put a ball on this thing, it would eventually roll downhill. And here we've minimized free energy. At that point, in other words, we've maximized entropy. Now, what if instead we imagine that there's not a small difference from one macro state to another, but a huge difference? You start out here, and there's a major drop in free energy from one macro state to another. If there is a huge drop like that, conceptually, it means that the slope of this thing is going to be really steep. So I can write that this thing is steep. Whereas this one is shallow. So in our ball and basin models, giant amounts of free energy. So that means when one macro state is so much more probable than another macro state. So when there's when there's a massive entropy difference between one macro state and another, when there's a huge amount of free energy, then we picture the evolution of the system a bit differently. Is that now it rushes very quickly downhill. It's very fast, and the steepness of this. You say, well, where do you get that steepness? That's the dissipative structure. It's like in order to generate entropy that fast, in order to get rid of the free energy that fast, it forms a temporary engine that helps it along. That's the tornado that, you know, it's suddenly it's like, um, you know, we've got way too much energy in the sky right now. Rather than gradually just allowing things to heat up and come back to equilibrium, there's so much more energy that instead of just allowing the heat to diffuse and warm things up. Instead, it actually restructures the clouds into this massive object that does work on the rest of the, the world. And in doing that work, produces entropy at a much faster rate. And that's what we see in the ball and basin model. So, um, so that's kind of that there. That is where we get this of structure. And living beings are thought to be one of these non-equilibrium dissipative structures. We, uh, we are here because there was so much energy available that the sun just couldn't gradually warm up the rest of the solar system until the solar system and the sun were the same temperature and everything stopped. That will eventually happen. Eventually our solar system will all be the same temperature. But until we get there, we're here actually increasing the pace of that because we're creating more and more entropy than we would if the sun was just shining and the heat was just gradually uh, you know, increasing the, the vibrations. Yeah. The dissipative structure is the movement of the ball from one basin to the other? Or what, part, what part of the model? In this conceptualization, the, the uh, slope is the structure. So, or the, the structure is the thing that is creating this slope. So, um, or they kind of go hand in hand. In order for free energy to fall off so quickly, 
it needs something above and beyond the normal sort of background processes of things just bouncing into each other. And it, so it needs to produce a temporary entity that actually starts doing work just to waste energy. That's what we're here. We're just wasting free energy. That's what life really is fundamentally from a physical level is uh, we are taking the opportunity to exist, but in doing so, we are uh, reducing how much time like, our solar system will have to exist. So either we have a boring solar system that lives for a very long time, or we have an interesting solar system that burns itself out much more quickly. Uh, isn't, isn't the first law that energy is always conserved? Yeah. Energy is, yes, but not free energy. So that's the that's the, the clever thing here is that um, if I have gravitational potential, I take a ball or a tablet or whatever, and I drop it, um, then the energy I loaded into the ball turns into kinetic energy. When it hits the ground, that kinetic energy jiggles all of the molecules of the carpet in the ball, and it turns into heat. At that instant where it turns into heat, all of that potential energy that was loaded up here ceases to be used for it. I can't like now use the ball to power up. Um, and so that's what I mean by free energy goes away. When the object is up here, I can charge my cell phone. I can drop it and turn it into heat, or um, I can hook up a little device that instead of causing my phone to drop and, and it, this is actually you know, how uh, hydroelectric power works. You know, I can either let the water fall uh, and reach maximal speed, or I could slow the water down and turn uh, something that generates electricity. And that's you know, hydroelectric power. If I let the water hit the ground, I've lost the ability to harness that energy. And so that's what I mean by free energy. You have free energy at the top of the waterfall. Once water's at the bottom of the waterfall, you're done. There's no getting back. All you can do is take the water and pump it back up to the top, but that's going to take work to do. Does that make sense? It's a great question. And by the way, that's some of the ways we store energy is by pumping water up into reservoirs. If we have a bunch of extra energy from like solar, one of the things they're doing with it is they're using it to pump water into a reservoir on the other side of hydroelectric. And as it increases the water level, it allows you to get some of that energy back later. But by doing that, you lose a little bit of energy because whenever you do work, some of it goes into entropy. And so if you can't use the energy now, your ability to store it is going to reduce the amount of energy you can use later. Questions about that? All right. So I'm going to go from this to an example that I'm hoping will be eye-opening. Um, so, what are some applications of all this stuff? You know, uh, well, one of the things is econo, uh, uh, I guess say econo physics or economics plus physics. Okay, so um, the idea here is I would like to try to understand. What is the natural state of wealth distributions in a community, in a country, for example? Um, I know that overall, um, or even in this room, we could all sort of get out our wallets. Who am I kidding? We all got our wallets at zero dollars. But um, but if we all had money in our wallets, we could get out all our money and we could count how many dollars, how many physical dollars we have, and. Um, and then we can say oh, overall, between all of us, there's a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever. And then we can play a game um, where uh, we would, every time we randomly bumped into each other, we would um, this, you know, flip a coin to decide whether I give you a dollar or you give me a dollar. If you can give a dollar, if you don't have any money, uh, nothing happens, or I give you a dollar. But as long as the transaction can happen, I randomly give you a dollar, you randomly give me a dollar. That is a stochastic model. Of economics. So, you know, in a real market, we're pet buying and selling services, but we can say we don't know what services we're buying or whatever. So, we can sort of just say, well, stochastically, let's just assume that whenever you run into someone, there's some small probability you're going to trade a little bit of money in one direction or another. So, in that case, we have macro states.
which are distributions of wealth. And microstates are different configurations of personal wealth, which, um, you know, distributed around a population. Okay, now I'm modeling activity, so economic, so econ activity is random, small transfers of wealth. And so we know that a total wealth is constant. Um, and uh, so basically also average wealth is constant. So in a perfect world, what would be a good wealth distribution? Any guesses? Yeah. Relatively equal wealth or relatively even wealth distribution. Right, relatively even wealth distribution. Wouldn't it be great if we all had enough resources? And let's just say wouldn't we all have the same amount of resources and it's enough? So maybe, you know, and say let's say example one, um, equal wealth. So everyone has the same. We can model that as a macro state. We can say that there's a distribution where this is uh, dollars per person, and this is number of people with that amount of dollars per person. So it's like you know the frequency. And if we have uh, let's say t total dollars and n people. If we all had the same amount of money, we would be at some point um, T dollars divided by N people, and there would be everyone would be at that point. So we would have over here all N people would be having T, um, T over N. So this is what an equal wealth distribution looks like. Any questions about that? All right, how many microstates correspond to that macro state? How many different ways can all of us have an equal amount of money in our world? Yeah. One, that's right. So the multiplicity is one. So there's only one way this could happen. Do you think this is stable? No. This is the lowest entropy macro state. This is guaranteed to have a lot of free energy. It's guaranteed for that ball to roll downhill into some other distribution. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can actually solve for the most likely, for the lowest, sorry, for the highest entropy distribution following this. And the highest entropy distribution, so the one with the largest number of macro states, is where I started an exponential distro, where again we would have dollars per person, and we would have frequency, so the number of people with that, and it turns out that it looks like this. And so we have a few people have a lot of money, and most people have very little. 
You can show this mathematically. As most microstates. All right, so the punchline here is that this is not an equal wealth distribution. But it turns out that this, by the way, crazy thing is a real wealth distributions are approximately exponentially distributed. And this, by the way, has another name. When you have a conserved quantity and you randomly trade it, the dis this distribution I, in that special case has a special name. It's called the Boltzmann distribution. And so it applies to energy in particles. It applies to dollars in wallets. And the punchline here that I'm leaving you with here today is that if you just allow According to this stochastic model, if you just allow an economy to run free, you don't need any evil forces for you know, concentrating wealth in a small group of people. You don't need any evil forces taking money away from the poor to make them any poorer. This happens to be the highest multiplicity wealth distribution. This is the one that this system will just naturally go to by itself. So what does that say? If you want, if we think physically about it, if you want equal wealth, what do you have to do? If you want to put all of the particles in the corner, what do you have to do? Yes, it's yeah. Put in work. You have to put energy into it. It is impossible to get equal wealth naturally by itself. This is part of the reason we have to have things like governments and so on. If you don't have some additional work being put into the system, and that's what a quantum physics message is. All right, that's what I want to leave you with today. Um, we didn't talk much about information theory, but we'll just come back to that um, later. Um, the big thing is. Um, I just won't ask a lot of information theory on the midterm, but we will come back to info theory a little bit later in the semester. So for now, um, I'll give you this attendance slide. Come with questions on two things. My question for you here is um, how many different ways can everyone have the same amount of money in their wallet? With that, have a good weekend. Here's my score. Any questions on Tuesday? Oh, don't forget those assignments. Um, um, the the new the, the C1 assignment for reviewers. Yeah. The question is how many different ways can all of us have the exact same amount of money in our world? I just like to see you. Oh, <laughs> Really good.